Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Today we're talking specifically about Tula Mosin Nagants and an interesting, I guess you could say sort of a misconception that comes along with them. Now, the title of this video today is talking about are Tulas less common? Now, with that immediately comes a question of, first of all, why less common than rare? And if you want to know why, you'll have to go check our older video on my like 53 minute rant on Mosin rarity and the term rarity. So we're going to say the word less common. <clears throat> but as a follow up question to that, uh, less common than what? Well, specifically today, we're kind of going to be doing a comparison of Tula Mosins with Izhevsk Mosins. And the main reason is because this Mosin, this 9130 rifle, is probably something we're all familiar with. These were made in the millions, especially during World War II. And if you've seen a Mosin or if you've had an experience with a Mosin, it's probably going to be something that looks a little bit like this rascal that we have here today. <clears throat> now, in particular, this guy is in fact a Tula Mosin. And You've probably heard a lot of people say that Tula Mosins are rarer or they're less common than Ijevs Mosins. And this is, well, sort of true. It's kind of half true. And as Paul Harrell says, when you're 50% right, you're 100% wrong. So I want to dissect a little bit as to why that's partially true and why that's partially not true at all. So first of all, we need some context here. We're talking about World War II right now. And in particular, let's say from 1941 to 1945 uh, in there. If we look at that range and compare the number of to, uh, Mosins produced by the Tula factory versus the Yezhev's factory, well, it's very easy to tell then just from production numbers that there are many, many more Ijevsk Mosins produced in that time than there are Tula Mosins like this guy. So that's true. During World War II, just off of production numbers, we know there's a lot less Tulas produced. Still made in a fairly large number, but there were so many Ijevs Mosins produced in that time frame that this really pales in comparison. Uh, now, why is that, first of all, in World War II? Well, part of it's because, if you recall back to some of our previous videos, we've talked about how in 1940 the Tula factory stopped producing the 9130 rifle in favor of starting to produce the SVT-40 rifle instead. Alright, so move ahead to 1941, Tula Factory is still not producing 9130 rifles, but then the Nazis invade the Soviet Union, and then the Tula Factory promptly has to be evacuated. Okay, so now they're not producing 9130 rifles or SVT-40 rifles. And then once they move, I don't know how you evacuate a factory, but apparently they did, and they moved it across the Urals, which I think is quite an impressive feat, especially for the 1940s. But once they were able to move the factory and get it set up in a strategic location where the Nazis weren't going to immediately be a threat to it, they did start producing the 9130 rifle again, and they realized, well, <laughs> we need as many rifles as we can get, these are a lot quicker and cheaper to produce, so this is what we're going to go with. So they started producing them again, but from a logistics standpoint, I mean, if you look at the hardware and the resources the Ijevs factory had, it was enormous. And the Tula factory just trying to come up to speed again with that, it was never going to happen. Even over the course of several years, it just never got there. So the Tula Mosins are definitely less common. The Jez factory was just cranking out millions and millions and millions, un really uninterrupted. So that whole process from 1941 to 1945, they just kept getting more efficient and better and quicker and cheaper about producing these rifles. Tula factory had some struggles, especially when they came back after 1942. So because of that, and because, again, this is the most common variant you see of Mosins, 
that's really why people f say that two Limousins are less common. So, in some respects, this is true, especially if we're talking about the World War II era. And it's not just the 9130 rifle, because remember, Tula Factory also produces, during World War II, some M44 rifles and M38 rifles. But those are in far less quantities. Those are actually quite a bit scarcer. So there's another good example of why you might say that they're, they're less common than Izhevsk produced Mosins. Um, now, this also goes for the sniper rifles as well, and this guy is an ex-sniper rifle, so this used to be a PU sniper rifle back when he was produced in 1943. Uh, you could go off down a, kind of a tangent down a rabbit hole and ask yourself, well, are PU snipers produced by the Tula factory rarer? Um, yeah, pretty much. You don't see nearly as many of them. Um, are they more desirable? Probably. Uh, personally, I actually prefer Izhev's pattern rifles because the Izhev's rifles, they, uh, and the, at the factory, they stamp the scope serial number on the rifle. So that's really cool. You get a little bit more history that you can trace as well as it's a little bit easier to authenticate. So that may be a little bit more of a gray area of are they more desirable? Some people will definitely say yes, perhaps most people. That's more of a rabbit hole, though. Again, if we're just focusing on production numbers, yes, the snipers are going to be less common pretty much uh, down the board. Except, I guess, for PEs, because the, the Izhez factory never even produced PE sniper rifles. So you'll only ever see, a, 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 that's, that's real, a Tula PE sniper rifle. Okay. So that's World War II out of the way, but this is where things get a little bit tricky. Because remember, if you're half right, you're 100% wrong. So if you have a universal statement saying Tula Mosins are less common than Ijev's Mosins, it's simply not correct. That's because, again, if we move back in time before World War II, it gets a little bit hazier. If we look at the inception of the 9130 rifle, yeah, it wasn't exactly 1930, but it was close, say the early 1930s. If we go from there to say 1941, and we look at the production numbers of both the Tula factory as well as the Ijez factory, what we'll see is it's actually quite a bit closer in terms of production numbers. We don't see like, exponentially more being produced by the Ijevs factory in that time period. So it's a lot closer. So in those years, I mean, so there'll be some years where one produced more than the other for sure, but it wasn't like an exponential, like 10 times more, generally speaking. So in that time period, eh, not really. No, no, they're about the same actually. Uh, but what about before that, right? Let's, let's go back a little bit before that uh, to World War One. Well, now we go back to the year 1917, which is when this particular rifle was produced. And this <clears throat> is when things start to get a little bit uh, cattywampus, as we would say here in America. Things are going to get flipped around. When we go back to World War I, and even, maybe for the sake of this rifle story, go back to the early stages of the mosin uh adoption and production, around 1892, 1893, and 1894, one thing you'll notice is that the Tula factory started producing large quantities of Mosins a lot faster and in higher quantities than the Ijevs factory did. Okay, why would that be? Well, there's many complicated reasons. Uh, one of them, though, is the fact that the, uh, the Tula factory actually had a little bit better, probably a little bit better experienced workers working for them. They had a little bit more well-established uh, machinery, perhaps. This really goes back to back in the days when all of the serfs were freed back in the 1860s. We know the Ijez factory had a lot of problems with that. And we talk more about that in part two of episode one of Legends Never Die.
but that may be one of the reasons because if you don't have a lot of good experience workers or things of that nature you're going to have some issues getting things set up this is this is a lot more complicated than just that though there's a lot of things that went into this but what we see historically is that the Tula factory started producing more Mosins once this rifle was finally adopted back in the early 1890s. Uh, and generally speaking, it would kind of just continue all the way through World War I, okay? The Tula factory actually produced far more M91 rifles, like this guy, the longer pattern rifles. Although you'll notice this guy is missing the very long handguard. But still, this is an M91 pattern rifle, and the Tula factory ended up producing a lot more of these rifles than the Ajez factory did. Kind of an interesting story. Now, another thing that goes into this is you gotta remember, the Tula factory up through World War I only produced this pattern of Mosin, the M91. The Ijez factory, though, around this era in World War I was actually producing, or responsible for producing four different types. We have the M91 rifle, the Dragoon rifle, the Cossack rifle, as well as the 1907 carbine. Now the 1907 carbine obviously didn't come around until 1907, 1908, 1909, around there, but the Dragoon and Cossacks came around in 1893 and 1894, respectively. So that's another reason you probably don't see as many Ijevs rifles being produced, is because you would have a lot of their dedication resources dedicated to producing some of these other variants, because they were the only factory responsible for producing things like the Cossack and the Dragoon rifles. Uh, the Tula factory, as well as the Sistrayetsk factory, which we're not really talking about in this video because it's pretty understood that factory is less common, generally speaking, uh, than Tula or Ijevs. So, yeah, there's a lot of variabilities. There's things about equipment, um, resource availability, manpower, experience. A lot of that is going to go into these types of things of why did one factory produce more than another, and were they actually doing other stuff? One other interesting thing is the fact that really probably since the 1870s, the Ijevs factory was like the premier barrel production factory in Russia. And what you'll see is the Ijevs factory pro provided many, many barrels and barrel blanks to the other factories. So the Ijevs factory was doing a lot, right? You're you're, you're supplying the other factories with materials and, and resources. You're making other patterns of rifles as well. So in this time period from like the Mosin's inception up to World War I, Ijevs M91s, I wouldn't say they're rare, but they're, they're quite a bit less common than the Tula M91s. So Whenever you see an Ijevs M91, it's always kind of interesting because they're not nearly as common as you might think. And, you know, M91 guns in general, like this guy, aren't all that common. I mean, this is probably about the most common one you could see. This particular rifle was produced uh, by the Tula factory in 1917. Obviously, during the war, you're going to have a much larger production numbers. We see this in World War II, and we also saw it in World War I. Now, the Jez factory did really ramp up production of the M91 rifle in World War I, uh, much more so than they had in the past. They probably still did produce some Dragoons and Cossack rifles as well, but remember, this would have been the main infantry rifle. Uh, those were sort of just extra on the side and they needed infantry right like frontline infantry rifles so that's really what you would see produced so Ijev's m91 rifles aren't super uh, uncommon to see in years 1915 1916 and even 1917 those are fairly common um there'd be the most common m91 patterns for sure but you'd still see more Tula rifles being produced in that time. So when you think of like 
World War I and earlier, the most common Mosin you should be thinking of is the Tula factory. Which is weird, because again, when we get to World War II, it's the opposite. The Tula factory is the less common. So this is why things get a little bit trickier. Um, and also, there's certain years where eh, one, one may actually be quite less common than one. And if you look at a year, interesting year like 1918 or 1919, well, pretty much any Mosin made in those years is crazy rare, regardless of, of who made it. I mean, an uh, exception to that may be Remington in 1918, but that's going really off topic. It just goes to show, though, that you really have to understand the exact rifle and the time period you're dealing with to understand, okay, well, how many were actually produced in that time period? And then compare that to how many other variants from other factories were being produced in that same time period. So that's where we can draw uh, some interesting conclusions, such as, generally speaking, Tula Mosins are going to be less common and more desirable from the World War II era. Whereas, uh, maybe pre-World War II in the 1930s, you know, eh, they're about the same. And then if you go before that, around World War I and before World War I, the Tula factory is going to be the most common, and the Jez factory is going to be a little bit more desirable from a collectability standpoint. So it just goes to show that, folks, Mosins are a really complicated affair, and it really helps to just understand exactly what it is we're dealing with here. And in particular, y'all might remember seeing this guy before. This guy is, in fact, Mick Jagger because somebody decided to paint him black. And I always like getting out an old war horse like this guy. I mean, you know, we can talk down about how a 1917 Tula M91 is going to be the most common and least desirable M91 rifle, but that doesn't really mean that much to me because this is a, still a really historically significant rifle and it's super cool. Uh, this is already a lot more interesting and collectible than just say like the a 9130 like the one we were just looking at earlier. Really cool piece of history even if it is for its class maybe the most common. That really doesn't take away from the fact that this is a really important part of history. And one of the big goals on this channel is to help increase the awareness of these old World War I war horses because these guys are still kind of forgotten in a lot of aspects and we need to change that, folks. Now's a good time to get one of these, by the way, because the prices of these are only going to go way up because these guys cost about the same here in America as 9130 rifles do, maybe just a little bit more. That isn't going to be the case forever. So. I warned y'all. So thank you guys for watching. Hopefully this helps clear up a little bit of confusion surrounding two Lamosins and their collectability and rarity. If you guys like more Mosin Nagant content like this, please consider subscribing. Let me know if y'all have any prayer requests, and we'll see you next time.